Welcome to AkronHipHop.com, where we paint positive images of our people every day. My name is Deborah Calhoun. I teach at Kent State University in the Department of Pan-African Studies. And today's installment of Understanding the Black Experience is to touch a little bit on a place about 8,000 miles from us, Kemet, or Egypt. Hey, Hiram, how are you today? Hey, man, I'm pretty fair for a square. Now, yeah. listen, some people trip out on me when I say the Egyptians Back down the wheel of time, prior to the uh, Mediterranean connection. Okay. Okay. I want to say prior to the 18th dynasty and further. Okay. It was black. Yes. Kemet was and is a black civilization. So is that why we call Egypt Kemet? Because Kemet represents the black land. What's going on? Well, Kemet is K N T or the hieroglyphs where the Egyptians themselves acknowledge land of the black. So it meant the black faces, it meant the dirt, the black land in terms of inundation from the Nile, which produced black silt, which helped fertilize the land. So the land was black, the people were black, it was a black world. So let's go elementary style. So why do people get mad, like uh, Eurocentric America, uh, Arabs and everything, why do they get mad when you stake your rightful claim to your rightful birthright? Because someone wants to steal that birthright. Often, if you write the history, you can write in or out who you want and the interpretation of what you want to be or not be, because you're the victors and you write the books. But literally, we wrote our own history. Absolutely. Right there on the wall, right there in the Medunetta. Yes. Right there in the hieroglyphics, right? Yes. yes. Medunetta meaning hieroglyphics and everything. Right. But right there, we're showing you we are black and we painted ourselves yes. black with noses just like yours. Of course. Okay, and everything. Um, You got a favorite... Um, pharaoh don't you i do but i will say before i talk about my favorite pharaoh i will say the egyptians themselves understood themselves to be black because the the, the issue often was and is in anthropology and archaeology wherever you define and identify yourself is where what you are and the egyptians in the homo nefer papyrus talks about we came from the beginnings of the nile at the foothills of the mountain of the moon so if you understand where the foothills of the mountain of the moon is, we're talking about Mount Kilimanjaro. And the last time I checked, Mount Kilimanjaro was in Kenya. And the blue and white Nile, or the origins of the white or the Nile begins with the blue Nile, which has as its source, Mount Kilimanjaro. Man, you know what? I'm excited right now, because you write down my wheelhouse. I try to tell somebody um, Egypt was black. Yes. Um, Kemet is black. Now let's go from why the distinction, why do Eurocentric America call it Egypt and those that's in the know that's well studied, where did the term Kemet come from and who popularized it here in uh, America? Well, Kemet is what the Egyptians themselves called themselves using the hieroglyphics, which meant beautiful speech. The Egyptians tried to make everything in their world beautiful. They were very obsessed and a little OCD in a good way about line, design, function, balance. Everything had to be perfect in the Egyptian cosmology and worldview. How did we get how did we get the, the word Kemet here? Well Kemet is more popularized with the growth and the study of Egyptology and African centered methodology. That's what I wanted to know. Okay. African centered methodology. And we know Egyptology is the study of image, I mean, of Egypt. We already yes. know that. Now, when you throw an Afrocentricity, I mean, Afrocentricity into it, or Pan-African world real to that thing, mm -hmm. you get terms like uh, Kemet, yes? Yes. You can see the truth. Right. Who popularized it? I, mean, I can say some names, but have you said Well, there's several. I think, for me, the top on my list is Dr. Ben Yakinen and Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dr. Charles S. Finch. Um... My, my guy out of Chicago who passed recently. Um, oh, I have to think about him. He'll come to me later. What about Henry Clark? John Henry Clark, easily oh, one of those. Yeah. Sheikh Antijope, in fact, he was the one at the UN conference who was able to talk about the Egyptian because he went back and understood the Medu Netter and the hieroglyphics. What's the difference between the Medu Netter and the hieroglyphics? I'm just excited. Well, the Medu Netter is the writing. So, it's the same thing. But the hieroglyphs is what the Greek called them. Oh, so there's a Greek connection. There's a Greek expropriation. Explain. Uh, they stole it and changed the names. 
just like we talk about the idea of certain dynasties in terms of the comedian landscape, it doesn't become Cleopatraized until the introduction of Cleopatra, I think, in uh, the, one of the Ptolemies, as they call them, those sets of kings and queens, in her case, that came from Greece. Well, I'm just going to shut my mouth, put, sit back down, stand it up, and let you take it, um, try to go a little bit from your PowerPoint if you want to. Uh -huh. I the computer if you want. Uh, sure, you can pass it on to me. <laughs> yeah. But what I want to do is, uh, in terms of our work, uh, we have to understand that the Egyptians uh, or Egypt was point central in the ancient world, if you think about it. Um, the great so-called philosophers, the Greek and the Grecian philosophers, studied in Egypt. Egypt was the university to go to. You went south for knowledge and information. Greece and Rome was a happenstance. We know that the Mediterranean is right across uh, a little bit of uh, water called the Mediterranean Sea. Um, but it was the fact that folks went south for information. Ptolemy studied, Her Hippocrates studied, Socrates studied, um, Galen studied, all the philosophers, Herodotus even visited and wrote about and talked about Egypt. So we know that these folks talked about Egypt in positive terms, but the problem is, and it became as, as those folks went back home to their respective locations, it's like they forgot that they were taught by the masters and didn't reference the masters in their work. Um, Hippocrates, for example, so-called father of medicine, he studied under Imhotep and the uh, association or group of grouping of medical practitioners. And Hotep, remember, was the grand visor, the one-hand man, right-hand man of King Zoser. It was he who built the step pyramid, those sets of mastabas or uh, rooms, if you will, stacked on top of each other in a pyramid, but step form. That's why they call it the step, S-C-E-P-P-E, -E, the step pyramid. But it's through Inhotep being both an architect and a doctor that he was able to leave the legacy of what we would know now as the, uh, the Egypt uh, in our minds and whatnot today. The form of the pyramid changes from that of the stepped formation to the more pyramidal type formation with the smooth sides that we now know of that's on the Giza Plateau. Um, these are places of honor. These pyramids are places with, in fact, burial chamber, chambers. And in fact, a son would often start building on his father's pyramid. And he would also start his own, which would be carried out and finished by his ancestors and family after he has made transition. Um, but what I want to do is talk about um, some of the contributions of the Egyptian cosmology. Again, you can go to Dr. Hilliard. He was a number one reader and studier of the Medu Netter. In fact, the organization, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations is one of many foundational organizations and groups who study the Medu Netter on a regular basis. So not only where they can read it, they can write it. And what is important about this is that when you can read and write your history, you can truly tell your history. We don't have to re reference and, and talk about uh, E.A. Wallace Budge's work and Napoleon's work. Remember, the European could not read the Medu Netter or the hieroglyphics until they found the Rosetta Stone, which had hieroglyphs, Coptic, and Greece language on one stele or one tablet, and they were able then to crack the code. Other than understanding and discovering the Rosetta Stone, Europe, Napoleon had no clue as to how to read the beautiful writing or beautiful speech. Um, I'll hop to, I think, some of the, and I'll put some of these pictures up as we talk about them, but I want to talk about some uh, contributions, at least, of the Egyptians in the field where they stand out, which is medicine and in terms of mathematics. In terms of mathematics, or excuse me, in terms of medicine, we have the Edwin Smith Papyrus. And the Edwin Smith Papyrus is a set of writings that talk about issues and problems of the human body. The Egyptians were able to understand circulation of the body. They were able to understand what a stroke looks like. They were able to understand and interpret problems of, of, of the body and of the organs. They had a, a urine test for pregnancy. 
uh, they were able to, through this papyrus, talk about disorders of the body, of the head, face, and organs, and talk about prescriptions for curing those. In fact, many mummies, and not everyone was a mummy, but we know that folks had inju injuries in Egypt. So some of these folks who have been unearthed, examined, we see that there have been operations performed on them, whether it's a hole in the skull to relieve pressure from a stroke, or whether it was to fix a bone, because we know the bones always tell the story. And where one has broken a bone, we know that the person probably lived after the surgery because the bone shows evidence of healing itself. Uh, the Edwin Smith Papyrus also has the instruments, the tools, descriptions of how to use them and how to make them functional in terms of in a doctor's and a physician's kind of way. Um, so I talked about Hippocrates studying under Himhotep. So the, the Hippo Hippocratic Oath is really an oath to Asclepius, which was the brotherhood that Imhotep started. Remember, he was a master doctor, a master architect, a master engineer. Um, so basically, Hippocrates kind of stole that information and that documentation. In terms of mathematics, um, we know that the, math the Egyptians were masters of builders. They built for eternity. They built for the next generation. And for anyone to build a pyramid, one must have a mastery and understanding of not only mathematics, but you have to understand angles, you have to understand uh, weight bearing and load bearing walls, you have to understand how the shifting and, and movement of the earth affects a particular set of weights. I will say on my trip to Egypt in 1996 with Dr. Ben Yakin, and we went to the Giza Plateau in the middle of the day. And at high noon, you cast no shadow because your shadow is directly under you. In fact, the orientation of those pyramids are off maybe 1 16th, even today. So that means that the Egyptians were spot on with how to position and place brick work how to understand load-bearing walls. And in fact, I think the, um, the beauty in Egypt is in understanding how weight and math and stone all work to together collectively. In fact, in the tomb of Seti I is Pythagor what they call Pythagoras theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And this is a way that the Egyptians were able to get perfect right angles, whether it's in statuary work, whether it's in brickwork, whether it's in funeral temples, whether it's in pyramids, they were able to understand um, the pyramids and all forces and phase, phases and ways. So some of the things that mathematically that we have with us today, because everyone has to take math, all of our children are taking math remotely and classworks and things like that. We understand that there was a standardization needed to build tombs and other structures. The Rhine Papyrus particularly talks about numeric procedures of finding the area of a rectangle, finding the area of a square, finding the circumference of a circle, finding um, the slope of a particular angle, uh, sines, cosines, tangents, trapezoids, triangles. To understand these higher math concepts, you have to have an understanding of your world. Not only just your physical world, but the celestial world, because the ideas of math translate also to understanding of the stars and astronomy. Um, if you think about it, everything we have in the modern world has basically been done already by the comedians who did it first. So with this brief introduction, this is just a touch. We will visit this again. Egypt is an awesome place. We all need to go and understand our legacy. This is Deborah and Hiram for AkronHipHop.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, remember to like, share, and subscribe this video. Tap the notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, remember to share, share, and share again. Thank you, and I'll see you again next time.